Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thomas, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And friends of Google Memorial Library, welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, this amazing institution. Um, the, um, the T here is in red because it was pointed out to me earlier that when you speak about the Bronx, the T is capitalized. Uh, I think in the, uh, I realized in the invitation that went out, the T was not, but uh, properly capitalized. At any rate, for those of you who don't know it, <clears throat> the Bronx Community College uh, is home to over 7,000 full and part-time students. It's a two-year college uh, that's part of the uh, 20 plus colleges and universities in the CUNY system. It's the most accessible uh, rung, I would say, in the CUNY ladder. It serves the poorest population in terms of con congressional districts in America. Uh, and it is this entry to, into the middle class. It's an absolutely indispensable institution in terms of the social and uh, economic ecology of the city of New York. Uh, this is kind of where New York will continue to be uh, the greatest city in the world if places like the Bronx Community College can continue to thrive. So I encourage you to know about it and to support it. Um, but rather than talking about this wonderful institution, I'm gonna talk about the place uh, that they call home. This is uh, the uh, University Heights campus of the Bronx Community College. Uh, it has the distinction of being uh, the only uh, uh, community college in America that has uh, a city, state, and national landmark as part of its complex. <clears throat> and uh, so it's a, it's a very special place as recognized in that respect. Uh, and that was really started by this man here. This is Henry McCracken. Uh, Henry McCracken was the chancellor of uh, what was changed to New York University or NYU. I think it was called something like the City University of New York. And uh, um, he was ahead of a small, at best a regional college, but he had big ideas. He was down in Greenwich Village. And in order to realize those big ideas, he need to, needed to expand, but could not because of the real estate issues in Greenwich Village. Uh, so he bought 40 acres of land in the Bronx uh, and uh, elected to move the college and certain graduate schools up to the, uh, up to the Bronx. Um, it looks like this today. <clears throat> the uh, landmark buildings are the red tile roofs uh, on the upper left of this picture. Uh, this campus, as you see it today, is principally the work of three great architects. There's uh, Stanford White, uh, for the buildings with the red tile roofs. Uh, Marcel Breuer uh, did a number of buildings which were off to the left of the screen. And then uh, Robert A.M. Stern Architects uh, designed that really marvelous building on the right, North Hall, which is this library, really a gift to the students of Bronx Community College. <clears throat> well, it looks like this today, but McCracken's vision was that it would look like this. Um, McCracken uh, had an idea uh, based around the building in the center, which would be the library, uh, that he would take a building called Main Hall, which was down in Greenwich Village, right on Washington Square, <laughs> designed by Town and Davis in the 1830s, and he would move it stone by stone up to the Bronx, uh, where he would rebuild it and use it as a kind of seed pearl to create this new uh, sort of neo-Tudor, neo-Gothic campus. Uh, well, what he found out was that the cost of moving Old Main uh, up to the Bronx and rebuilding it was equivalent to the cost of five new buildings. So uh, that really put the, the lid on that idea. And he turned to, uh, after looking at a number of architects, he turned to an architect. And that architect was Stanford White, who you see on the left of the firm McKim, Mead and White. Now, this was actually a pretty logical choice because McKim, Mead and White were well on their way to becoming the most famous architecture firm in the city, if not in the entire country. Um, they were fresh from their uh, success at the World's Columbian Exposition at Chicago in 1893. Uh, Charles McKim was working with the trustees of Columbia University. Uh, he's on the right there uh, on their move up to uh, Morningside Heights. Uh, and Stanford White had designed the uh, uh, Madison Square Garden, which was kind of the most wonderful new building in New York. And he was the most visible architect in New York. So in addition to the getting the job on the strength of qualifications, I think Stanford White, to some extent, probably got the job the old fashioned way, uh, which was his father had been the first marshal of his class uh, at NYU about 35 years before. And uh, 
So uh, whether, I mean, he was known to the trustees. And so for whatever reason, White was qualified, got the job and set to work on designing this new campus up at uh, the University Heights. <clears throat> he came up with a site plan <clears throat> after working with McCracken on several iterations. Most of the iterations involved the orientation of what was called the Ohio field, that uh, great element in the middle there, which was a gift from a group of Ohio alumni. But in the end, they settled on this, um, this north-south orientation, which separated the uh, residential precinct on the left uh, from the academic precinct on the right. Uh, and White particularly focused on the first buildings that would be built uh, on the campus in the academic precinct. Uh, the library and two classroom buildings, which are in this circle here. Well, for the library, White came up with a rotunda plan. You see it here, two rings of columns uh, surrounding a central space with a, a layer of support spaces around it. Uh, and anybody who, any architect really who comes up with a rotunda plan is automatically referencing uh, the Pantheon in Rome, seen here in a uh, 18th century painting uh, when it had been converted into a church. It was originally a secular building. Um, but what's sort of interesting about the Pantheon is that, it, you know, it's the, the said to be the most copied building or the most influential building of uh, ancient times. Um, every architect who looked at the Pantheon for inspiration would take something different away from it. Uh, that, for example, McKim was impressed by the, there was, urban nature of the Pantheon and the way it closed off the space of this square. So um, he uh, took that design and he uh, eliminated the pediment. He ext extended the porch with a couple of extra columns on either side, uh, got rid of the pediment, uh, put a big attic in there and um, created this sort of massive structure that really holds uh, anchors and closes off the open space uh, at the north end of Columbia uh, green uh, up on Morningside Heights. Well, um, Stanford White looked at the Pantheon quite differently. He uh, saw it as, I think, a, um, I would describe it as a, a sort of Palladian uh, institutional palazzo. I mean, a building uh, that is much, is sort of pretty rather than imposing. Uh, and he made, he paid real attention to making it pretty, and that's pretty in the best sense of the world. I mean, that's pretty in sense of beautiful. Uh, in that sense, he, was in, he took his lessons or looked at the Pantheon really through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who similarly saw his version of the Pantheon as able to hold its own in space, not by closing space off, but by its figurative qualities with uh, a uh, identifiable form uh, and with a modest, in this case, amount of decoration, those Corinthian capitals, the denticulated cornice, the ridges on the dome. Uh, and so having looked at the Pantheon that way, uh, White proceeds to design his version um, of the Pantheon. Uh, but I think that Thomas Jefferson in his wildest dreams uh, would never have imagined how much uh, ornament and decorative, decorative elements uh, Stanford White could add to his version of the Pantheon. In fact, an aspect of Stanford White's design is sort of a core component of his uniqueness uh, is his ability to um, put uh, ornament into a uh, design to a sort of a level of density that approaches saturation, and yet uh, then sort of backing off with areas of relatively smooth limestone or variegated brick. Uh, so he achieves a balance, a sort of a visual compression and release here, but he never uh, lets the ornament as thickly as it is applied uh, interfere with the reading of the whole. It contributes to, but does not uh, in any way take away from the design. Uh, well, the dominant element of this building is, of course, the dome, and the dome encloses the reading room. Uh, this is what the reading room looked like in the early 20th century, uh, and the reading room was the, the great strength of the, uh, of the design in that it had this tremendous symbolic value. It was a wonderful place to be in. You knew you were at the heart of the institution when you were in that reading room. But the reading room also was one of the weaknesses of the design and that it only held about 90 readers' desks, which for an institution the size that McCracken had in mind was a woefully inadequate number. And so how people, it must have been the first come first serve for getting those desks to uh, use the reading room. But uh, 
Uh, it, it would always sort of dog the design that, that as much as people loved it, there was just a limited number of people who could get in. Um, in addition to the reading room in this under the Great Dome, uh, Stanford White was quite clever in the way he sort of wrapped that form with a, a, a layer of support spaces, in this case, book stacks. They're you know, open, ready reserve, closed reserve, uh, special collections, depending on what sh shade of blue you're looking at here. Uh, but he uh, really was sort of ingenious in uh, sort of filling up those spaces without uh, in, interfering with the shape of the building itself. Again, that was a strength in terms of his skill. It was a weakness in terms of the library. The uh, library stacks need to be uh, open and adjacent and easily transferable and easily locatable. And uh, the people who worked in the library after a while uh, had to be uh, sort of like explorers to find books here because of the way these things were hidden uh, in these little spaces. It was sort of brilliant uh, at the beginning, but it worked against the library towards the end. This whole complex also included uh, administrative offices. These were the days when the administration of a college or a university uh, was a lot smaller than it is today. Uh, McCracken's office was at the top of the stairs on the left. Uh, there was probably a vice president on the other side, uh, and then probably had a bursar down on the lower floors on the two rooms on either side of the main staircase. Um, it also sat on top of a auditorium. This was a structural tour de force, uh, but they pulled it off. The books helped to counterweigh the, uh, the cantilever of the uh, um, floor of the reading room here. Um, it looked like this then. This was actually called the chapel, uh, and it's possible that there were compulsory uh, religious services uh, when this first opened because McCracken was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, today, uh, it looks like this, and there are no compulsory religious services. Uh, in fact, that this auditorium is used not only by the college, but also by lots of local groups. High schools have graduations there. And so it's a space that is used um, with some frequency and by a great variety of people. There was one more element in the program, and I think it may have come into the program late, uh, and that was this element in yellow here. Um, that was a museum which held the uh, college or university's collection of large paintings and very heavy frames. I mean, you wonder where they are today. Uh, and it had my favorite object, which was this enormous lump of coral uh, that you see in the foreground. <clears throat> I think the, I'm not sure if the museum was part of the original program. Uh, I think it was something that was added because he needed the form, as you will see, uh, and he needed some way to fill it. Well, with the building design and the campus design, the next job of the job of a president of a private university is to raise the money uh, to build this thing. And so it's a saying in development that if you ask somebody for money, they give you advice. And if you ask them for advice, they might give you money. Uh, well, clearly, um, uh, McCracken asked this man on the right, his name is Charles R. Flint, uh, for uh, money. Uh, Flint was the head of what became the International Business Machines Corporation. Um, at any rate, uh, having been asked for money, Flint gave uh, McCracken some advice, and the advice was uh, to ask Andrew Carnegie to pay for the thing, uh, which was um, great. I'm not sure if um, McCracken ever approached Carnegie. There's certainly uh, absolutely no indication that Carnegie uh, came up with the dough, because usually uh, if that happened, there would, it would be the Carnegie Library and not the Gould Memorial Library. So um, McCracken goes back to his home team, uh, which in this case was Jay Gould. Jay Gould was the great railroad financier of the late 19th century. And some people considered him to be the great scoundrel of the late 19th century, the way he manipulated railroad stocks. But he made a huge amount of money, and he was very, very generous to McCracken. He paid for a, a dormitory uh, in the residential precinct, and he helped uh, McCracken with the money to buy the 40 acres of land in the first place. The problem was that in the 1895, when they were uh, raising money or looking for the money for this, uh, Gould was not no longer living, uh, but his children were, including his daughter, Helen Gould, who um, had inherited her father's money with her brothers, but who was also the first woman to have graduated from NYU's law school. So she was completely home team. She looked at the plans, liked the plans, and agreed uh, to support this project uh, if it would be named in honor of her father. So with the uh, design in place and the money in place, the next step is the 
groundbreaking. Here is the invitation to the groundbreaking uh, in October 1895. Uh, the, uh, actually, the building on the left, uh, the Hall of Languages, was already built at the time of the groundbreaking. But the uh, real, uh, the main event here was the groundbreaking for the Gould Memorial Library. And the first thing that gets built is that museum section. Uh, and the, I think it was first for uh, because it, it would have been impossible to get access to it after the library was built. I mean, it, but visually, this was important, uh, as I say, rather than programmatically, because visually it keeps you from so feeling as though the library would be sliding down that steep hill. Um, so the museum gets built, and then, then the library gets built. You see a picture here of the library, probably in a high state of completion, with the quadrangle uh, looking like the scene, scene of a war zone. Uh, interestingly, about uh, five or six years ago, the quadrangle at Bronx Community College looked exactly the same way as they were uh, upgrading all of the subsoil drainage uh, there. But now it has been put back together again. In 15 years, those trees are going to be magnificent. So uh, it's really going to be lovely. Well, while the building was under construction, there were there's a lot of correspondence between <coughs> Stanford White, the architect, and McCracken, the client. Uh, and it shows that there's a sort of a certain, just a, a, a certain edginess in their relationship. Um, uh, White is told by McCracken that he's got to cut 10% out of the overall cost of the project, which White does, although he never says how he does it. Uh, and uh, then White sends McCracken a sort of a chiding letter saying that McCracken cannot give instructions directly to the contractor, that these things have to go through the architect so that there's a basic lessons in uh, sort of architectural protocol. Um, but the, uh, I think the most amusing of these exchanges has to do with this element right here, um, which was a mock-up of the winged victory of Samothrace, which McCracken wanted uh, to have put on top of the dome. White hated the idea, uh, but he was willing to get his friend McMonies to uh, give McCracken a bid of $15,000 to make the replica, but White insisted that they do a mock-up first, which they did, and uh, everybody agreed that the mock-up did nothing for the building. So White was happy because the mock-up uh, was eliminated, the statue was eliminated. Um, McCracken was happy because he had $15,000 to spend on something else. Um, the uh, But this was soon sort of, over, uh, sort of overcome by a more serious problem, which was this visual issue of the relationship of the library to the base, uh, that I think what happened was that White, to achieve the 10% uh, savings, which was about $100,000, basically eliminated any treatment on top of the museum. Uh, and now this is what it looked like. And everybody agreed that it, there was just a really raw relationship between library and base. Uh, it didn't look like it was sliding down the hill, but it didn't look particularly comfortable either. And so uh, they arranged for some mock-ups. Uh, they um, hooked up two balustrades, which you see on the left, the Greek cross, and then the Renaissance balustrade. And then they arranged for this mock-up of a uh, element with square columns supporting a roof that went around the uh, circumference of the uh, museum. Uh, if you remember the invitation to the groundbreaking, this element was in that invitation, but it had been clearly cut out to uh, at least pretend that they were saving money. Well, it was the right thing to do. They did it and you can see that it has this sort of wonderful combination of uh, sort of enclosure and transparency. It's just a brilliant architectural solution uh, for a problem. Well, with the, uh, this building, at least the exterior finished, the next problem that comes up involves these two men. There's Stanford White on the left and that's Louis Comfort Tiffany on the right. Uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany, the stained glass window designer, was also a decorator. He was the most successful decorator in America, probably, at the time. He and Stanford White went back a long way. In the early 1880s, uh, Tiffany's father, Charles Tiffany, the uh, head of the store, had hired McKimbeden White to design a three-family house at the corner of 72nd Street and Madison Avenue, which you see here. And uh, the idea was that Charles would live in it, his daughter and her family would live in it, and then Louis would live up in the attic uh, with that great window that you see overlooking Madison Avenue. <clears throat> and that had an interior that sort of looked like an opium den. This was Louis's apartment, and I think Stanford White probably helped Louis do it, although Louis certainly didn't need much help uh, in coming up with things like this. 
Uh, a few years later, uh, White and uh, Tiffany collaborate on the Veterans Room at the 7th Regiment Armory, uh, said to be the most important uh, aesthetic period room in America. My firm had the pleasure of uh, the honor really of helping to restore it a few years ago. So they knew, they went way back and they knew each other. But uh, what happened here and Gould was, had to do with this letter here that Stanford White is informed that Louis Comfort Tiffany is gonna be doing the decorating of the interior and Stanford White hits the roof because he says it should be his choice and not their choice. Tiffany was a friend of Helen Gould's and I think uh, she probably imposed him on the project. Uh, Stanford White writes this letter, which begins, we should of course be very happy to consult with Mr. Tiffany. Well, any letter that begins, we should be very happy, uh, clearly suggests that the architect is not very happy, but White pulls himself together uh, and uh, Tiffany sends in a proposal, which is accepted. Uh, and Tiffany is responsible for all of the kind of painted and gilded finishes in the uh, building. And basically if it has a shape, uh, it's attributable to Stanford White. And if it has a finish, the finish is attributable to Tiffany. So the painting, the gilding, uh, the mosaics that run around uh, and the stained glass windows were all produced by Tiffany Studios uh, on the basis of a proposal and an acceptance. If there is a tragedy here, it is that there is no record of the artistic collaboration between the two. There are no letters or samples saying, you know, gee, I think it should be green, so it will go with the columns, or it should be a little less green, so it will uh, support the columns, whatever. There's just no record that they did anything other than sign a contract and supply the goods. But the goods are amazing because this interior is, I think, I cannot think of a sort of more successful marriage, really, or of um, architecture and uh, decorative finishes. Each of them uh, is reinforcing the other. Um, the other issue that comes up in the white McCracken uh, um, edgy relationship has to do with this stair here. Um, McCracken feels that this stair is too steep, too narrow, and too tall. And the problem is that McCracken uh, articulated his uh, reservations after the stair was built. So there was nothing White could do about it except to come up with some justification or rationalization that would basically satisfy McCracken. And White does a really masterful job. He writes a letter to McCracken saying that uh, this staircase is based on the design of two staircases, the golden staircase in the Doge's Palace in Venice, which is on the left, and the Scala Regia in Rome, which is on the right. And White goes on to say that the staircase that he has designed for Gould uh, is not as tall, not as narrow, and not as steep as either of these two staircases. Well, somehow this uh, sort of uh, nonsense seemed to work, uh, and McCracken uh, gives up on any complaints about the staircase. But the facts are that it is steep, it is narrow, and it is tall. I mean, it, McCracken was absolutely right. Uh, but um, Stanford White knew what he was doing. Stanford White's architecture on interiors is, again, an architecture of compression and release. It's a processional architecture that, that leads you and, and guides you and encourages you to go in a certain direction. In this case, the direction is that you go up that stair and you get to the top of the stair and you're a little winded because it's a little steep and a little tall. Uh, and then you go through those doors at the end. And there is not a single person who goes through those doors who does not take a gasp for their breath and just admire this extraordinary dessert that Stanford White has served up uh, for the benefit of people who were willing to go up that stair. Um, what a space. I mean, really, this is an interior landmark and it uh, deserves to be one. Uh, well, with the building finished, the building is open. Here's a picture taken from opening day as a sort of a wonderful candid character to it. Um, and it's interesting that this is precisely the moment that Hollywood chose um, to incorporate into a critical scene in the movie, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, which is starring Ray Milland as Stanford White and Francis Fuller as his wife, Betsy. And uh, Ray Milland is a very handsome Stanford White. I mean, I recommend him far above anything that HBO has been able to come up with lately. Um, but uh, in this movie, the key scene takes place at the dedication of the Gold Memorial Library. And here's the scene straight out of the movie there is the library in the background, the Hall of Fame and the museum. Uh, then standing in front of that is a group of extras. And then in front of that, 
a figure in an academic gown and with white hair and a hat, and that is McCracken. I mean, they got the hair and the hat absolutely right. Um, but I think you know the crowd of extras is a crowd of extras, but the but the element in the back is a flat that has been painted onto a canvas. That is just a painting uh, in some sound studio at MGM. Uh, and what's interesting there is that it's um, not kind of an original view. It's taken from from something, and here is uh, its relationship to that from which it was taken, which was a postcard uh, that you could get sort of at any stationery store of the Gould Memorial Library and the Hall of Fame. So the researchers at the film studio really just had to go down to the newspaper stand, uh, do their research, and come up with uh, their shot for this particular scene. Uh, well, the library does get finished, and uh, it is a really magnificent looking thing. Uh, the end of the project, there is an accounting uh, and it's shown, this is from NYU, that the cost of the library exceeded uh, the total donations by $8,000. So less than 1% overage. I think Stanford White did a really terrific job. Um, that uh, uh, element that he put over the museum did account for $100,000. So I think that was the 10% that he had cut out. Um, but uh, so Stanford White does work to budget, uh, but there are other uh, so discontents that uh, uh, are between White seen on the right and McCracken seen on the left in a more civilian uh, dress, which was uh, White writes uh, McCracken a letter uh, saying that the firm hasn't been paid for 18 months and, uh, uh, and he would really like to get paid. And then McCracken sort of responds to that with a really nasty letter uh, saying that he has a, he's enclosing a bill for repairing a skylight. Uh, it's the third time they've had to repair the skylight. Uh, White is going to pay for this repair. White was an idiot for putting a skylight over books. And then McGracken sort of goes really off the rails and talking about how um, all the good ideas in this project were McCracken's and all the bad ideas, which McCracken uh, put the kibosh on, were Stanford White's. And then finally, he sort of pulls himself together, having gotten this off his chest, and says that, well, the building is going to be a great success, and, and Stanford White should uh, have the uh, pleasure of getting credit for that success. But just to, it shows that these projects are very, very hard on client and architect alike. Well, the, notwithstanding the relationship between the two individuals, the library was a huge success. I mean, it became the center, a ceremonial and operational center, really, of the entire campus, the place where academic parades such as this, uh, which the likes of which can never be put on again, uh, sort of started and stopped. Um, <clears throat> McCracken invented the Hall of Fame. I mean, he had the space that he had to fill. And so he came up with the idea for a Hall of Fame for Great Americans uh, 30 years before uh, the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. <clears throat> and you can see that the uh, fame of the Hall of Fame extended well beyond the postcard uh, to include um, uh, a bottle of uh, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey that you could get at Bloomingdale's. Uh, and uh, so it was a well, it was a very popular tourist destination. And you can see what the, uh, so the collateral uh, elements of it were. Uh, in the 20s, Stanford White's son, <coughs> Larry, who was an architect, designed a set of memorial doors for the library, those wonderful bronze doors. Uh, he got sculptors who had worked with Stanford White to contribute the bas reliefs that you see, a really lovely set of doors. Um, and then the last time that McKinney and White was involved in the NYU campus was in the late 20s when they were hired to come up with a master plan for a really uh, ambitious expansion of the uh, campus up on University Heights. You see in the lower right-hand corner is Gould uh, with the Hall of Languages and the other classroom building. And then after that, it just goes to town. Uh, well, this was, I'd say, killed by, uh, for starters, by the Depression. I don't know how much of it they ever would have realized, but the Depression came along and none of this was built. And McKimby and White did not work on the uh, University Heights campus again but other architects did. And uh, they struggled with Gould because Gould, as I say, had trouble with uh, the seating capacity. It had trouble with the rearrangement of books. It had trouble with the capacity of books. Nobody in 1895 had the remotest idea of uh, what the ultimate uh, sort of number of volumes that a library had to contain were. And so here you see a sketch produced uh, which expands the museum probably to hold uh, additional book stacks. 
At this point, the architects working on the campus or uh, which are, uh, include Philip Johnson. Um, and uh, I, yeah, then um, the worst thing that happened was in the late eight, 1960s, somebody threw a Molotov cocktail into the auditorium as a result that it was damaged, uh, as you see here, including the, uh, the Tiffany window you see in the background. Um, this, this was repaired, but it kind of took the spirit out of NYU. They were already having trouble getting students to come up to the Bronx to go to school. Uh, and so in uh, 1973, uh, NYU bails out of the Bronx and goes back to uh, Greenwich Village. Uh, and the city of New York buys the campus for $65 million or $60 million uh, and gives it to Bronx Community College. But they leave, everybody leaves Gould alone. This is what it looked like 50 years ago. This is what it looks like today in these uh, sort of stack spaces uh, so wonderful spaces, but not easy to use for other than uh, book stacks. And uh, so it was in this condition. And, you know, they say that a, a, a used landmark is a loved landmark and aspects of the Gould are unused. And, uh, uh, and that is a problem. And it's a problem that was recognized by the Preservation League of New York State a number of years ago. They put uh, Gould on their seven to save list uh, to raise the uh, public awareness of uh, Gould's condition. And I mean, the college knew about it, but the public didn't really know so much. Uh, and this was terrific because the Preservation League introduced the uh, uh, Thompson Family Foundation to our preservation uh, of Gould Memorial Library Group. And the Thompson Family Foundation uh, gave us $200,000 toward uh, retaining an architect to do a really top to bottom existing conditions study. And uh, we hired Bayer Blinder Bell uh, to do that. This is the cover of their report. Uh, they uh, recorded all the conditions. They made uh, recommendations for what repairs were required. They made cost estimates uh, for what that would be involved. The cost was $60 million, $56 million, $56.5 million, hard cost March 2018 dollars. So if you take escalation and soft costs into effect, uh, you are talking about a project in the order of $100 million. Uh, the advantage, if there is one, to this uh, rather um, uh, formidable task is that you don't have to do the whole thing at once. Uh, and that is how we are proceeding. Um, the first thing it, you have when you have a building like this is you have to keep the water out. And uh, this was a picture taken a few years ago of the roof uh, of the Gould Memorial Library with those wonderful fish scale shingles stamped out of copper. Uh, but then on the upper right is the, uh, the monitor uh, with the windows that would have let light down into Gould uh, in a highly deteriorated state. Well, um, Eddie Bardell, the vice president and the uh, staff at uh, the Bronx Community College that are responsible for dealing with the public elected officials uh, were able to raise uh, $14 million to replace this roof. And this is a picture taken recently. Uh, we were hired by our Blinder Bell uh, to do this job, uh, a wonderful job. They got an amazing contractor, Nicholson and Galloway. Uh, and there is the roof sort of three quarters of the way finished. Uh, here are some details of it showing the fish scale shingles uh, that have been stamped out. And here are the various details uh, that go around it. I'd say this is an example of your tax dollars being extremely well spent. Uh, because it not only uh, is a fabulous job, but it is going to uh, protect a valuable landmark for a long time to come. Uh, other issues that Thomas mentioned, uh, that famous staircase that is too narrow, too tall, and too steep uh, is uh, impossible to get up if you are not fully abled. And uh, we have a, a general scheme for a elevator that would make three stops. It would, uh, uh, in addition to its entry stop, it would stop at the auditorium level, uh, the main floor level, and then the uh, main balcony level. Uh, it would require landscaping, uh, a new door on the side of uh, the building. It would all have to be approved by landmarks. Uh, it's going to cost in the order of eight to $10 million because of all of the various work that is required uh, for that. But uh, again, the uh, the team at Bronx Community College has been working with the elected officials, and we will know on July 1st 
if we are, we think we'll be about three quarters of the way there uh, if they approve what we have asked for. Uh, so this is gonna be a terrific thing. It will make the building publicly accessible and you cannot have a public building that is not accessible. Thomas also mentioned the uh, second means of egress, that famous uh, door that go, you go through that makes you gasp for breath is in fact the only way out of the building. And uh, we have a design for a second means of egress that will be completed in September. The only reason it hasn't been completed is that the access stair for repairing the roof is in the way uh, at the moment, but that will get out of the way as they finish the roof up. And then you'll have a building that will have a public assembly permit. It will be legally able to hold 300 people without a fire guard and um, then eventually uh, it will be fully accessible to all. Um, the question is, what will it be used for? Uh, we worked with a group called the Capstone Group uh, from uh, NYU's graduate school, uh, I think it's the Wagner School of Administration, uh, and they did an evaluation and proposed four possible uses uh, for Gould, including an art center, a center for social justice. I think it was a center for community colleges was another one of them. But um, what's, what was important, I think, was not so much the specific uses that they recommended, but the methodology that they set out for evaluating the strengths of each of these uses. So uh, I don't know what use we will hit on, uh, but the second means of egress and the elevator are critical to the ability to reuse this building. Uh, what is less critical uh, in objective terms, but just as critical in subjective terms is seen in this picture, which is that plug at the top of the oculus of the dome uh, with uh, uh, a lot of burned out lights. Those uh, lights have been uh, upgraded. There is in fact a plan to um, uh, put LED lights in there, but what everybody really wants to do is to get rid of the plug uh, that's been there for at least 50 years. Uh, originally, light used to come into Gould Memorial Library. And this rendering, which was commissioned by Michael Parley, one of the members uh, of our group, um, shows light streaming into the center of the rotunda. Uh, it shows uh, sort of uh, purposeful uh, Bronx Community College students and faculty uh, on their way to do something, although exactly what they're doing, we don't know but eventually we will figure it out. Uh, we will be have, uh, eventually we will restore the building. Tremendous work so far. Uh, I'd say that the building is, um, justifies all the efforts we have put into it. And I believe that it truly is a palace for the Bronx. Thank you very much for listening to this. That ends the lecture. You're welcome. Thank ah, you, Thomas. Good evening, thank, thank you. you.